Good evening and a happy new year to everyone. A strange year indeed, but a very wonderful project to start with. My name is Lisa Steele. I'm the artistic director at VTAPE. We acknowledge we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit River, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. Uh, Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory, which is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to the territory, to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations, Métis and the Inuit people, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. And we bring that to this evening. Tonight, we're pleased to present the inaugural partnership project between VTAPE and Dr. Andrea Fatona's Center for the Study of Black Canadian Diaspora. Working with two talented emerging curators who Andrea suggested to us, Temple Maruchi Campbell and Fabiana uh, Germain Bajawa, both fourth year undergraduates from OCAD University. These programs draw from the holdings of both VTAPE and our sister organization, the Canadian Filmmakers Distribution Center. Over the next weeks, one title from each program is presented each Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time and will continue to be available for the following week until the next title rolls out. Each program will begin with live online introduction by Dr. Fatona, uh, an and, and introduction by the emerging curator, and followed by the first title in her program. After the final title plays, which in this case will be four weeks from now, February 9th, five weeks, um, there will be a live online conversation between the curator, between Temple, and her artists, and I hope you can join us then. I warmly welcome Dr. Andrea Fatona to introduce the Center and Temple. Andrea. Thank you, Lisa, and thanks to VTAPE and all the folks behind VTAPE who made this program tonight possible. Um, I'm Andrea Fatona, and I am the lead researcher at the Centre for the Study of Black Canadian Diaspora. And the Centre was launched in uh, March of last year. The Centre's primary goal is the development of a dynamic online uh, site, a repository for visual arts produced and media arts produced by Black Canadians from 1987 to the present. The, the goal of the, the center and this online um, repository is to make accessible and visible the works of Black Canadian artists and curators, craft people, writers and critics who have for the past 50 years been carving out a space for Blackness and Black cultural production in this country. Uh, the work, I'd like to also point out that this inaugural event uh, comes on the heels of a project that VTAPE and I uh, collaborated on in, in 2017, in which researcher Alicia Lim went through the holdings of VTAPE and um, pulled out the, the works uh, produced by Black Canadians over the period uh, mentioned. So this program, as well as a program with Yanya Lee, follows on the heels of this. And I'd like to thank, again, VTAPE for their commitment to continuing this project. I'd like to introduce Temple Marusi Campbell. Temple is a fourth year undergraduate student in the Criticism and Curatorial Program at OCADU. Uh, Temple's capstone project interrogates the absence of Blackness from the Big A archives and uh, the accents of specifically of Black Canadian diasporic subjects within the Canadian Big A archive and foregrounds the uh, works of artists as well as others who are engaged in relational practices that seek to create a counter archive. I'd like to congratulate both Fabino and um, and Temple for activating these groundbreaking works, media arts works in the, in the V-Tape holding and from CFBC uh, as a way to breathe new life into the work and to also produce, new, to create new perspectives from which we can actually look at the work. So thank you, Temple. And um, perhaps you could start us off by just uh, introducing yourself and telling us a little bit more about the program in terms of its focus. 
Yeah, of course. Um, I first want to start by thanking Andrea for recommending me for the opportunity. And I would also like to thank VTape, specifically Lisa, for um, helping me out along the way. So, hi everyone. My name is Temple Marucci Campbell. I am a fourth year thesis student at OCAD, currently studying criticism and curatorial practices. Um, my personal research practice looks to the intersection of art and food as a way to connect with ancestral knowledge that exists outside of a physical archive. And I kind of grounded the research I was doing for VTape um, in my personal practice. While I looked through the VTape and CF CFDC holdings, I was thinking about questions surrounding legacies. What can Black Dinosaur legacies look like? How can we heal our legacies? And I was thinking about um, legacies that were left to me, specifically the legacy left to me by my um, Guyanese grandmother. Um, and the way I can access that legacy is through taste. Um, I remember in my childhood during the summers, she would fly up from Florida and spend a month or two with my family. And being a picky eater, she knew I loved anything that was fried dough. So she'd make me roti with chana and palari. And I think those are my fondest memories I had with her. Um, and so eating food now that she would make for me as a child is a way for me to heal my relationship with her and kind of access this bank of ancestral knowledge that doesn't exist in the physical archive. So I wanted to take this opportunity I have with VTape to investigate how Black filmmakers are engaging with their past and how they find ways to heal or celebrate their legacies. Um, through my program titled To Remember and Repair, I wanted to explore various methods of remembering, especially ways that help individuals bring forth their personal narratives. Um, and so to begin my program, I'm, we're going to be watching From Nevis 2 by Christine Brown. And a couple of years ago, I was in conversation with my, with my um, paternal grandfather, who was also from Guyana, about what it was like to immigrate from here. And he was the first person I thought of um, when I watched this film. And I feel like my research kind of started from that moment when I had that conversation with him. So I felt like this was a really appropriate way to begin my program. Thanks, Thanks Temple. So the program starts in 1987 with Christine Brown. And Christine Brown, you know, groundbreaking media artist, first uh, feature Black woman making a feature film in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something about this program that traverses a whole history bringing you back to some of the foundational folks in the context of Canadian media arts. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if you talk about that in relation to, you know, this, this uh, deep excavation I know you're on in terms of trying to find traces of ourselves in, in, in archival spaces, but also the kind of relationship and dialogue you can have across generations. So, I mean, I, I've just given you a whole bunch of things to, to consider, but the biggest one is really around the kind of intergenerational dialogue and why you see this as so important. Yeah, so again, what I mentioned before where my research was very kind of foregrounded by my conversation with my grandfather. And I feel like, immigrating from the West Indies to Canada very much is where I think of my beginning of trying to go back to ancestral knowledge. And I, it was more of a personal choice to include um, Christine Brown's film at the very forefront of the program. And I feel like a lot of the time when I think about in, intergenerational knowledge, like specifically in discussion around black narratives, I feel like it's foregrounded by trauma a lot of the time and oppression often confines black narratives. And so I wanted to find a way to kind of bring healing and celebration to the forefront and kind of honor um, filmmakers and artists who are very much before my time and find ways that they were also engaging with concepts of um, healing and nurturing black archives. That's really interesting because you know I was in a conversation yesterday and the biggest thing I, I came away from it or the most important thing I took away from it was again this notion about celebrating black joy mm -hmm. um celebrating the fact that we're more than than trauma and just actually working with works mm -hmm. and engaging with works that we really just love that we really like 
to engage with. So it's really interesting to hear you also say that around the works. The other thing that that's really interesting, just from a very maybe intuitive point, is that you start with Christine again, you know, one of the bedrocks of, of mm -hmm. uh, filmmaking and media making in this country. But it's also, you know, really highlights to me um, part of what I think, what I know that we're trying to do at the center is to really um, make visible the fact that as Black cultural producers, we've been here um, making work, right? You know, making work almost a decade, uh, her work, this work almost a decade, you know, since the video art became something that artists were engaging with and that marginalized communities were really using to make voice. So um, I am really quite happy to see this film tonight, to this piece tonight, to really reground me because I haven't seen it in a long time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just to move on before we see the, the piece is, um, I just wanna talk a little bit more about how you see these pieces, a number of them ranging from 1987 to 2021. Yeah. What kind of conversation do you see or weaving through these works that have some real, um, uh, that is important for the now for us to think through? Yeah, I think I was really focused on reparative ways of remembering, like how as Black diasporic people, we can remember in a way that is holistic and kind of contributing to this very contemporary moment and building ourselves up. And I think each film touches on a very alternative way of remembering, um, like the film by Kaisha Williams, like they are discussing remembering and being with one another and kind of like celebrating the community we have um, or the communities we can create with other Black diasporic folks. And I think that one was really important. Or um, the Wash Day by Courtney Jackson, I think was a, engaged with a very physical way of remembering and repairing. So I think there's each film touches on how alternative ways of remembering can tap into these archives that might not be physical. So I think that's really the vein running through all these works, even though they're all from very different time periods. Is there something also about the kind of everydayness as well of, of, of Black engagement? Yes, I think that's like even wash day again. Like it's washing your hair and kind of taking the that time to focus on self-care is an everyday thing for a lot of people. And I, I wanted to kind of celebrate the mundane in a way while also making it something very special, even though it might be seen as average. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know that you've been really concerned again with these uh, with practices of relationalities, the ways we come together, um, the ways in which uh, it is through relation. I, th I think you see relation as a particular kind of practice in a way mm -hmm. that has an aesthetic to it. So, I wonder if you could just sort of tease that out a little bit before we jump into the piece, because I think there's something quite important about that uh, frame that you come to this mm -hmm. work with, right? Yeah, I think, I, I like to think that there is a level of kinship that you can activate through acts of care and kind of reparative acts. Um, and I think that the relationships that you're talking about are relationships that I've been able to unlock with other people who identify with the Black diaspora. And I think seeing it as a practice rather than just an everyday thing kind of grants it the power that it needs to be considered Black joy or kind of like exist in that realm. Um, yeah, I think that was a really good question. I think I need to And practices, that. practices <laughs> evolve too, right? Yeah. I think. So, you know, it's about also showing that range of, mm. and the diversity of the practices and ways of being. Yeah. And I think, I think you kind of touched on this before, but Black joy is a concept that has always existed. Like it, it might be a term that has been newly developed, but it's always, it's enduring. Like it's always been here. And I think through this program, I'm kind of trying to pick out the ways that it's been here and that people have been using, Black people specifically have been using 
reparative practices to engage with Black joy kind of forever. And then there's also this notion of embodiment as you talk about Black joy. I mean, the mm -hmm. body has to be involved there too. So in terms of, you know, these works and media arts work, this notion of embodiment and how that is able to be really expressed in, in ways that can be first person, mm -hmm. right, direct or not. So I feel, I mean, I guess I'm going to ask you this other question about what you think as a young scholar engaging with these works around the role of media arts, um, based on what you've engaged with around doing this reparative work that you speak of? Well, I think specifically in the realm of media arts, like I, I very much started um, with a background in film studies and I was very concerned with the question of how film could be untouched by the capital A archive and celebrate black narratives. Um, and I think video specifically kind of it, it involves itself with an immaterial archive, but it, it's kind of in this new realm where it might not physically exist, but it is kind of enduring and accessible. So I think video and film and media arts kind of is on this very interesting threshold between the physical and the immaterial, um, which is why I think it was so important to speak about bringing forth archives um, within this program. And what do you mean by the immaterial archive? The immaterial archive specifically, I um, you had recommended me a book by Jenny Sharp um, earlier this year, and she discusses the immaterial archive as this kind of place where narratives and stories and things that might not be physical um, can exist. It's an archive that is not concerned with physicality. Um, and I think a lot of my research is concerned with ways to tap into this immaterial archive, an archive that might not exist to like, just, you can't see it, but there are ways to access it through practices and specifically like relational practices that you can activate it and bring it forth and celebrate it. What other works have you been looking at in that, that sort of help you to think through those, uh, those spaces of immateriality where there's knowledge mm -hmm. about um, us as Black diasporic subjects. Yeah, I, I feel like the book, The Cooking Gene, I believe it's by Michael J. Twitty. He mm -hmm. kind of discusses, he, he's working at a place that's similar to Black Creek Pioneer Village, but he, as a Black man, is kind of put in the shoes of having to be a slave and like, an enslaved person who cooks meals. So he taps into this kind of immaterial archive of um, cooking and eating and ways he can connect to his Southern roots through this um, job that he's working. And I feel like that one was very, very informative to the research practice, research practices I was taking and really pushed me to think about embodiment as a method, an important method of research um, in the topics that I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. So is there anything you want to tell us to help us to set up uh, the piece before we go to the piece? Um, I think like what made it very impactful for me at least was kind of thinking about my grandfather and thinking about someone who immigrated here and had maybe a similar experience. So I feel like if there's anyone watching who might um, have someone in the back of their mind and kind of maybe bring forth that relationship while you're watching this um, film. I think that would be very beautiful. Okay, so. All right, well, let's. Thank you, everyone. And without further ado, here. My mother, 
she spoke to me before I left. She said, Juliet, you know you grew up poor, and I tried my best with you. I sent you to school. So don't go up to that place and follow those rich people up there, those rich girls, and fool around and not go back to school or go back and get your job because you come from a poor home and you have to work for yourself. You don't have anybody to work for you. My father said, well, if you have to go, you have to go. But I'm going to miss you. People in the West Indies, the people in Nevis, they think of Canada as everybody's up here, here is white. <laughs> no, when I was home, I heard that in Canada, lots of people speak French. So I had the idea that everybody, almost everybody, speak French except my family who is up there, are the ones who I know speak French. I was anticipating a short ride because, you know, in Nevis, it's short distances from one place to another beyond it is a smaller place. But I was surprised how long it took us to get from the airport to this hotel. And the buildings, the scenery is so nice. It's like a different world altogether compared to Nevis where I came from. And I expected it to be a big place, but not as big as it is. I'm from Nevis, Charlestown. I been working there for some time as a nurse. And I was thinking that it, I might have a better opportunity if I got a job or I get to Canada. So I'm going to be in Canada to be staying with my sister in Montreal. It's hard leaving. Nobody wants to leave the place where they grew up and go to a place where they don't know anything about. The only thing is that my sister was there already and she knew how to get around, and I was uh, hoping that she would show me around. I was glad to leave because the conditions in Nevis wasn't very good at all. It, um, working for the government was getting, the work was getting harder, and the pay wasn't getting any anymore. Um, the employees expect you to work long hours. I understand in Canada you only work eight hours. I was sort of worried because I understand Canada is a very cold place and I do not like cold at all. I understand you have to buy the different clothes for different climates and the clothes are so expensive. City Hall, I got a picture I, of City Hall, new City Hall, before I came here. And when I look at that place, I say, good heavens, this look like a little heaven all by itself. And when I came here, it's just the same thing. Well, some of my patients, they didn't want me to leave because I got so attached to some of them. There were some children who used to come and visit me every Sunday afternoon. And there was quite a few people who I got so accustomed to. And you know, when you get accustomed to people, 
It's hard to be severed. It's hard to be separated from them. They hug. We hugged and we cried. And we hope, we said we hope to meet each other soon. And we said that we're going to write to each other. We share Yeah. 